Benjamin Castle are Americans. Watching the footy. Liam Ryan saying kick it my way. I want to jump over the pack and here he comes. Oh, this is Buddy Franklin. This is the greatest show Got the handball off to Myers. Myers looking for the lead of Stengel. Gee, they're good. Gee, they're sharp. Oh, who else? McDonald. Tim From inside the centre square. Boys kick the goal. Both reference for and apologies to the Barrickville Singers. We welcome you to our round one recap here for 2023 here on Americans Watching the Footy. Benjamin Castle here alongside my brother Ethan in South San Francisco, California. Thanks also to Brian Barish for making us aware of the It's a Draw song in the first place. Yeah, my issue with the concept of the draw before the other night was that there's no song after. That's really the only issue. Like, there are times when a draw is fitting. Now, I don't like to see a draw when both teams play really well. I like to see a draw when neither team deserved to win. And I think that was the case here. I mean, if you had to say who had to win, I would probably say Carlton 60-40, even though they were probably outplayed. I think Ben did so many stupid things again. We've gotten very used to this from fourth quarter Richmond from last year, and uh, clearly... That hasn't been resolved yet. I almost called this. I had thought to myself in the shower, like, the day before we recorded our round one preview, thinking, like, all right, one of these teams has to not get punched in the dick, right? They can't both lose, and this was this was the next closest thing. I just really regret not actually getting to say it on air, because I would have sounded really fucking smart if I had done that. I kind of called a couple of the other things that happened this weekend as we'll get into as we go on through our round one recap, in which we'll talk about not just the games, but some overarching trends and just general footy discussion, where we're going to try to be a little less rigid with, you know, this happened first, this happened next, unless it's, like, essential to telling the story of the game. And there are a couple games where that's definitely necessary. Yeah, but overall, I want to give more in the way of analysis, and I think we had a lot to go off from what ended up being... A pretty entertaining, chaotic weekend with a little bit of everything, including the first season opening draw in 90 years. So how about we start there with Richmond and Carlton? Over 88,000 at the G, second largest crowd for a Richmond and Carlton opener in VFL, AFL history, and also the second highest crowd to see a draw in home and away. It's funny, this game got off to such a roaring start, we had... Two goals in the first minute, three in the first six of clock time, and then things just really slowed down. You ended up seeing Richmond just do some dumb stuff to fumble opportunities. Meanwhile, Carlton seemed to be more willing to take a little pace out of the game, mostly to counter Richmond, and I liked that just because that wasn't Carlton's game plan at all last year. They were so quick to move things forward, engineer things through Cripps, Walsh, whoever they could, and they took their time a bit more. Yeah, you had Carlton giving away a couple of dumb 50s that gave up a couple of goals. You had Tom Lynch just kind of being a dick. And I had said for the last couple of years, like, people are too hard on Tom Lynch. I I get it, now. I still think people are a little harder on him than they should be, but I'm starting to understand it. And then Richmond trailed by seven with eight minutes left. Shea Bolton decided to go for a snap instead of take a good set shot. He missed from 33. That kept the deficit at six. Richmond was doing a ton to lose. Carlton were stuck in their own end. By the time Lockie O'Brien had that big run, I really thought it was over. O'Brien was a smart substitute. And something you'll see, something you saw a lot over round one, is that you had some of the faster players on the list come on as substitutes to provide that extra run in the fourth quarter and... We absolutely adored one team's use of that tactic in particular. We'll get to that toward the end of things, but it looked like O'Brien would be the savior for Carlton. Four bounces, I believe. Kicks to Harry Mackay, and he slips on the new turf. Until that point, the turf hadn't been that much of an issue. It had been a little noticeable, and you'd seen some divots starting to form, but 
this was when people really took note of it and were reminded, oh, right, they just laid down new turf. And I almost said new sod, but I think it's partly artificial. Not much, but enough. Here's the thing. That was the play that would have sealed the game because Makai didn't have to kick a goal. If he gets anything, it's a two-score game, and it's done. And even if he just is able to take 30 seconds, even if he misses anything altogether, that could be valuable in and of itself. I still think he needed to at least hit something. And and you assume he would. Really, you assume he would. I mean, well over a 90% chance is, you know, if he marks that cleanly. But instead, Richmond are able to come back the other way, and it was Jacob Hopper who set up Tom Lynch to tie it with 17 seconds remaining on the clock. And I hadn't noticed Hopper nearly as much as Tim Taranto in terms of the new acquisitions. And that's understandable with just the monster game that Taranto had. Really smooth all over the ground. He and Daniel Rioli were really driving Richmond's movement. Rioli from halfback, Taranto in that next spot midfield through half forward. And really sometimes all the way up to the big targets, primarily being Tom Lynch. I want to talk for a moment about the crowd reaction celebration to Lynch's goal, because it was like three quarters of what you'd get for a winning goal in that time frame, I guess, where it's like, you know, this is almost certainly the final score of the game. Well, how many of the fans were checking their phones or using stopwatch or something to try to figure out how much time was left? If you're up by the coaches' boxes and you're able to peer in and see the clock counting down, that's one thing. Every now and then the ad boards show, you know, like the last five minutes stuff, but... I know a lot of people complain about not having the time up, but I kind of like it simply because instead of having like this countdown to the clock hitting zero, you know, the siren sounds and people go nuts to celebrate a one possession win... And that would be totally lost. There would be like, you know, a sense of a countdown. It, that makes me also think of how one of the networks that used to that used to have the AFL rights, I think it was 10 in at least tight games or maybe in all their games, they'd have the five minute warning where with five minutes left in the fourth quarter, they take off the countdown clock and switch to the running count up clock. And I can only imagine what the reaction was like at home for some games that had that like the great grand finals of 05 and 06, for example. What are your thoughts on having the countdown clock for the viewers at home rather than having the clock counting up? I mean, it's something we're used to just for American sports. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it as it is, because what does the time counting up really give us? Which is also why it's so funny that they have that in the stadium, but we don't usually see players do anything really stupid with it. I mean, you can think of Joe Dan or last year. And players still get information from the bench because they because there's a sense of well they they often hold up the signs. There's usually a big one they hold up at one minute, or sometimes if it's you know really late and you're just trying to hold on until the siren sounds for the end of, of the quarter, you might break out the power down button again, like Carlton did. See, this is the first time we've seen like a late tying goal. You know, we've seen other draws, but. They've usually been tied for the final minute or so. This was kind of a different, weird scenario, and I got a kick out of it. No pun intended. Or did you intend it? No, not, not at all. But as for actual observations from the game, you know, Carlton did sort of have one last chance after that where they could have gotten Blake Akers a kick at the edge of 50, but he bobbled it. He was pretty sloppy throughout the game, which is kind of ironic after we went on about how Carlton got him for nothing. I mean, yeah, it's one game, but it was just funny timing. Um, other observations I had was just Tim Taranto is so smooth. Like, he looks like he's played with this Richmond team his entire life. Like, not just his entire professional career, but his entire existence, where he's so in sync with these guys. I was also very impressed on the Carlton side with Jacob Wiedering, especially early in the game. He was a lot of times that last line of defense, especially as Mitch McGovern struggled early. McGovern got better as the game went on, certainly, but I really liked Wiedering. He's one of those guys that you trust in that role, you know, whether it's, you know, I see like Tom Stewart in that a lot. And no, I wouldn't put him on that Tom Stewart level, but he's in like that next tier of guys that you'd have to pick to be like the last line of defense. And I think that is just bringing more to focus as to how important 
his absence ended up being a couple times last year, particularly when Wiedering went down in the round 11 loss to Collingwood. They didn't have that last line at the end of it, and it cost him because Carlton Carlton. They Carlton here, but they still earned two points, so I guess that's improvement. It's just, it's really funny that it happened between these two teams, considering how both of their seasons ended. Again, I think Richmond was probably the better team by a bit, but they also made more losing plays. You know, sometimes you see guys make winning plays. Like, there was a spoil by Josh Dacos in the second quarter where he came down on Max Holmes, closed a ton of ground, and then made the play with his back to the field. That's like, that's a winning play, where you just know those are the sort of plays that win games. This was a case where instead you had the other end of the spectrum. It's like, these are the sort of plays that lose game. Ben Miller completely shanking a set shot, for example, and Shea Bolton with that snap as well. I wouldn't worry too much about these things because it's round one, but Richmond did so much of this last year, and other than that Miller shank, most of these things were not young players making young player mistakes. Like, you know, we've referenced that Harry Jones miss a thousand times, but it's like, He's a young player who'll have plenty of chances to redeem himself, and young players make mistakes. That's true in pretty much every sport. This, you know, what is happening with older guys, that's a concern. One positive note for Carlton that I haven't mentioned yet is that I liked Perry Mackay being a more important mark in the midfield. He was struggling getting into the game at first, and that helped really bring him into it. And if you could maybe have Mackay doing that uh, on one wing, going toward the middle as they're building up, maybe having Tom DeConing on the other, that could be a solution for this year. I did like DeConing playing in front of Pitnet, but I also think that he tired a bit too much as the game went on, so maybe that means more responsibility for Jack Silvani splitting some ruck time early, or do you play both DeConing and Pitnet and then sub out the less effective one? I'm starting to think, and there were a couple of stats from later games and a couple of plays from later games that really made me think this. Having two Ruckman isn't usually all that necessary unless, you know, I, I think the Ruck roll needs to more be, you know, like a Max Gone type that's a really good player elsewhere that can also take center bounces instead of just big guy who takes center bounces and might moonlight elsewhere. And as I'll get to later. More, more, of, more of a Gone, more of a Blitzovs than just a straight up Ruckman who can pile up all the fantasy yeah, claims that I'll be with that house or Jared Witz, exactly. Reese Stanley, who, as we'll talk about in the next game, had a pretty lousy game defensively, bleeding into other games, though. So how about we we uh, run through some of the stats for this one, the individual stats, and then we can move on and talk about those cats. Yeah, sure. Let's start with Richmond. Tim Taranto, two behind, 32 disposals, eight tackles, 542 meters gained. Daniel Rioli just pulled all 10 coaches' votes, 27 disposals, 681 meters. What a move to halfback for him. Took a little bit for it to really work out. He was an All-Australian last year, and don't be surprised if he stays there. Jack Graham, two behind, 20 disposals, 9 tackles, 1 shy of an octopus. I think he was the original octopus, wasn't he? The first time we noticed it, one of our episodes, one where I really just kind of went all out with the artwork, is so Jack Graham was an octopus? Yeah, because he had 10 tackles. In this case, he had 9, but... Uh, Shea Bolton, a goal, a behind, 18 disposals, 567 meters gained. And Toby named Curvis. Quick stop at Toby's and load up that play. 37 hitouts, 14 disposals, 11 tackles. That's the kind of complete performance from a Ruckman that we're looking for. Someone who can also pretty functionally push forward because usually you don't have to worry about the back six marking for Richmond, even though they were without Tarrant and Givkis for this one. George Hewitt led the Blues of disposals with 28 along with eight clearances. He and Patrick Cripps were both very active in the center square. Cripps with a behind 25 disposals and seven clearances. Sam Dockery had 25 disposals, eight marks, gained 553 meters, and kicked a goal that, as we found out on bounce, traveled exactly 65 meters in the air. Mitch McGovern, 21 disposals, 9 intercepts, 7 marks, and 542 meters gained. He, Jacob Wiedering, and Lewis Young all did well for themselves. Wiedering, 20 touches, 11 marks, gained 487 meters. 
Lewis Young, 20 disposals, 14 intercepts, and 8 marks. I really started to notice Young, I think it might have been in the St. Kilda game last year at Marvel as a really strong spoil, and he has kept up with that since. Richmond led the inside 50 counts 66 to 45, but their disposal efficiency inside 50 was only 37.9%. A reminder that when I look at that number, usually under 40 is a sign of defeat. 40 to 50, nothing to really write home about. If you're above 50, especially trending towards 60, that's a sign that you've usually found the right connections there. So definitely something for the Tigers to work on. But that game just ended up being such a slow burn after that first scoring flurry. I believe there were six marks combined inside 50 in the first half. And there were a total of 116 points scored. We reached that on Friday night, two and a half minutes before halftime. Before we get into that, I do have one last question about this Richmond Carlton game. You know how after a guy gets their first win or just first win with a club, sometimes, you know, they'll put him in the middle and then, you know, splash water and Gatorade and stuff on him. What if we did that for a first draw? But wouldn't most of the team be involved with that then? Yeah, it would just be Jack Revolt splashing water on like 15 people. It would be hilarious. Yes, though, well, Jack actually. Richmond has a bunch of guys who played in the draw against Frio last year. Carlton, though. Yeah, Carlton, it would be, it would definitely be most of them. Yeah, but Revolt broke a record by playing in his eighth draw. He stands alone above a few players, including his recently retired teammate, Shane Edwards. You know, the guys who created that song, the Barrickville Singers, it's the only song they have. No, they have, they have one other thing they were released alongside with it. Well, on YouTube, on their YouTube channel, I can only see the what. Well, on Bandcamp, they've also got one more kicking in danger, which is appropriate because that was another talking point this round. I say this, though, because that could be the most impactful YouTube channel with only one upload because Dante West, the originator of the famed DeVry Got a Basketball Ball Team video, has two other uploads. One called December 29th, 2010, 622 p.m., and one called my brother can dance better than yours. Does Nick Dacos say my brother can spoil better than yours? I don't know, but that that Josh Dacos spoil was an awesome play that deserved more credit. In a game where there wasn't much defense, that was a great defensive play. As I said, it surpassed the cumulative points from the opening night game before halftime. Only two or three games had a higher cumulative score all of last season than what we had between Geelong and Collingwood. And one reason why there wasn't much defense in this one is some damage done to both sides. Yeah, one of the main characters for this week did end up being the turf. It wasn't an issue for most of Thursday's game, but it was on Friday. It claimed a bunch of victims. A bunch of guys went down briefly, some longer term than others. Sam DeConing had a brief moment. Tyson Stengel had a brief moment. Remember, the Cavs were already without Jack Henry and Jake Cola Jashney. Mo Mitch Duncan. You could argue that Tom Stewart's right knee injury was exacerbated by the turf as well. That was what I was going to get to as the main one. I think it may have very well just been caused by the turf, but he suffered an MCL injury as an expect and is expected to miss up to four weeks. I'm, I'm glad it's not worse than that. And most importantly, Sam DeConing should be good to go this week against his brother and Carlton, which is especially important because not having either of those, the defense really fell apart down stretch in a game that the Cats ultimately lost. 19-11-125 to 16-7-103. I think the real lesson in looking at this newer look Geelong defense is that Really, it's honestly not much of a lesson to me. It isn't a surprise that Asaba Radagalea isn't ready to be that key defender on his own. I thought he did a pretty decent job other than a stretch late in the first quarter. I just, he's not clean enough yet. He gave up a couple dumb frees in the second half. Yeah, but I liked his performance overall. He was not, I mean, he'll, he'll be able to grow into a steadier role down there, but... All things considered, it wasn't that bad. The six coaches' votes seem pretty reasonable. As he gets more time there, I think he's going to be really solid. I was disappointed with Reese Stanley, who gave up a bunch of easy marks, including one to Jamie Elliott, one where he got pushed on a throw-in by Mason Cox that led to an easy goal for Taylor Adams. 
he and Rada Galea kind of miscommunicated and left Cox open for a goal. We never thought highly of Stanley as a defender in the first place, so this wasn't much of a shock. It was just a move necessitated by having lost to Stewart and De Koning. He also had one unnecessarily powerful fist where Hawkins wasn't able to convert a forward hit out into anything, which is very strange. He had a botched handball that set up the goal that tied it at 99 in the first minute of the fourth quarter. He was just not good in his own 50, and I'd rather have Mark Blitzovs doing that. And I wouldn't be opposed to, you know, as guys get healthy, maybe you look at kind of doing some of what Port did last year with Finlayson, and it's like, all right, we won't really have a true Ruckman, and we'll just have our best 18 on the field. Because, you know, I've never been the biggest Reese Stanley fan. I thought he played very well last season, but he showed some signs of regression here and just did not play well. Meanwhile, when push came to shove for the Pies, their big interceptors did hold up their end of the bargain. Specifically, Darcy Moore and Nathan Murphy. Moore won a number of contests against Tom Hawkins, especially late to keep things in Collingwood's favor. And there were probably four or five times in the fourth quarter in particular where Murphy ventured off of his one-on-one assignment by a good 10 to 20 meters and ended up intercepting pretty much every time. Murphy and Bo McCreary were two guys that like throughout this game just made winning plays, as did the sub for Collingwood, who came on because of an actual injury and a pretty scary one at that. Yeah, it was a compound fracture for Jeremy Howe to his arm, and yeah, I'm glad he signed on for another year because had he not been, I would have really thought of that injury as maybe being a career ender. Yeah, the broadcast would not show that one again, and I, uh, I get why. So... So who came on but uh, your sleeper for Collingwood? Reef McGinnis was absolutely fantastic. And on the other side, Brandon Parfit did not play very well in that role for Geelong. I think back to last year, how great Luke Dollhouse was in that role once or twice. And I'd rather see Parfit in the main 22 if he has another performance in the sub role like that. I mean, I think it's great that you have to put a guy as good as him in the sub role. But well, who else would you think about? sliding out of the main 22 as a sub. I assume somebody like Mark O'Connor could be on the fringe, but I think O'Connor was a pretty clean player throughout the night. Yeah, and considering how thin the defense was, that would be really tough to do. Speaking of O'Connor, when these teams play again late in the season, I would have him tagging Taylor Adams. Not that Adams had the biggest possession numbers of anybody, but he was always the guy kind of linking the midfield to the forwards. And pretty much every touch he had was a high-quality one. Only 16 touches looking at things, but but very involved. And that combination of Taylor Adams, Jordan Degoe, and Tom Mitchell is downright scary. Adams and Degoe by themselves were already enough of a hassle for most teams, but adding Mitchell into things and having a good enough group around him in the center square means that He's able to get those center clearances for which he's been renowned at Hawthorne much more easily. And then you can think of it like Melbourne in the 2021 Grand Final with how quickly those three could end up producing goals. Adams, three goal assists tied with Dugowie and Gryan for most on ground. Gryan, by the way, finished with 19 disposals, kicked a couple of behinds late that didn't matter much and just kind of helped drive the point home because the Cavs took a 97-75 to lead with 7.38 left in the third, where Reese Stanley had a miss, but then Nathan Murphy held Ollie Henry in the goal square. Henry missed on a snap, but Collingwood had a 50 that gave him a free goal. I'm still not sure what that 50 was for, but I'm just going to assume that it was abuse for Braden Maynard. Maynard was even more Braden Maynard than usual in this game, getting into it with guys a bunch of times, and it's funny that he's such a nice guy off the field, because he's a real dick on it but that goal was 738 left in the third was the last goal Geelong scored they got up scored 60 to 6 the rest of the way and yes they had been kicking freakishly well they were 16-1 and you expected some regression but it wasn't so much just poor kicking and lack of converting shots it was a lack of generating any chances where they just ran out of gas and with the amount of injuries it's understandable and it's why I'm not 
super upset by this loss. Yeah, with a, a lack of rebound chances being generated in particular. When they were able to get turnovers in the middle of the field, they were more able to drive play forward throughout the game. But yeah, this this is understandable considering where their defense was between who had not been selected and who went out during the game. I don't think there's that much to sweat here, especially with the injury prognosis being reasonable for Stewart as well as DeConing. It's just, look, it sucks to lose to Collingwood. It sucks to lose your first game of the season, especially as rating premiers after the um, March and everything with, you know, Selwood leading the fans into the stadium. Geelong are the first reigning premier to lose round one since the Eagles in 2019, by the way. But I take this as a very much an it is what it is kind of game. This was a team that stayed very healthy last year for the most part and unfortunately got hit with a lot of injuries at once in this game and just weren't going to... You're not going to win too many games like that, even against bad teams. And Collingwood did a great job every time they got down three goals to close the gap. And, you know, with what has been called a couple times the Great Wall of Geelong was reduced to, like, a sign saying, stop, turn around, go back, or don't. I have a sign, not a cop. I was going to make a reference to Hadrian's Wall because it's actually very low, but I think yours does a little better there. The other performer that I was disappointed with in this game was Cam Guffrey. You never thought you'd be saying that Zach was the better Guffrey, but Zach had a solid game on a night where there were too many good individual performers. Did Cam lose his powers when he cut his hair? I don't know, but 15 disposals is not going to cut it. Meanwhile, for Collingwood, there were a couple players where we weren't sure about their viability in the best 22 for the long term, and they more than answered our concerns, those being Mason Cox and Bobby Hill. This is not Daggett Bobby, this is way to go and welcome back Bobby. You knew he was going to get one, he ended up with three. He was excellent, and made you forget Jack Ginevan was out. You can't be too upset about giving up three to Bobby Hill, considering what he's been through. I was just, you know, when you get to the point where you're missing Stewart and DeConing was at like maybe 20%, you're not going to have much of a shot. And it's the most points Cats have given up since the 2021 final against the Demons when they also allowed 125. Or last year, the most they allowed all year, I believe, was 109 to Sydney in round two. This is a team that's, you know, normally kind of scuffled through the first eight or nine rounds and then really taken off. But it's just... It sucks, but it's not like this was a game that you got robbed in. It's just, I'm glad there's a rematch where hopefully both teams will be healthy and they'll get to go at it again, and it'll probably be a down-the-wire game because this one ultimately wasn't as Collingwood finally pulled away down the stretch. They took the lead with 16-38 left on a Tom Mitchell goal. Then McGinnis got one. Crisp missed, but it put the lead up to 13. That was big. And then McKinnis set up McCreary. McCreary had, you know, a very un-McCreary game based on what we've seen from him before. Not much in a tackling role, but more on a half-forward flight job and was phenomenal. Had two goals to go along with 20 disposals. Tom Mitchell had two goals from 21. Taylor Adams kicked 1-1 from 16 and had three goal assists as did Jordan Degoe, who had 25 disposals, 11 score involvements, 8 marks. He got 10 coaches' votes, and deservedly so. Scott Pendlebury is ageless. A goal, 27 disposals, and 8 tackles. Able to still slide in and out of the midfield effortlessly. He will get to 400 games. And honestly, I could totally see him going for Brent Harvey's record at this point. John Noble had 29 disposals, 7 marks, and 637 meters gained. One of the most active ground gaining games for him and then both day cost brothers were big movers josh with 27 and nick matching his jumper with 35 along with seven marks and 579 meters gained not too many big individual performers for geelong already mentioned grind's three goal assists other than that isaac smith a goal 21 disposals 730 meters gained and jeremy cameron kicked 2-1 with 16 disposals and eight marks big takeaway from this one is just Please win next week and get healthy because I'd like to not be 0-2 and, and I'd like to not have losses to both Carlton and Collingwood. The attendance for this game, by the way, was 86,595, the second most 
for a Geelong versus Collingwood home and away game. Unlike a lot of losses, I don't have much criticism for Chris Scott. There are two things, though, that do come to mind. One was not putting the tag on Adams. The other, Tanner Broon played a nice first half, and then they moved him to the wing, which seemed unnecessary, especially when you have Max Holmes on the wing. This ultimately became, as it went along, it became pretty evident, like, this is a game that you're not going to win, which is frustrating just for it to be like that, like I said, season opener, reigning premiers, where you think usually when you're the reigning premiers, your first game is supposed to be kind of more of a victory lap. At least I'm thinking, you know, that's the way it is, say, in the NFL. Now, that's not always the case. Look at the Rams last year, but more often than not. So I like it being a, a rematch from the finals run, though. I don't like the grand final rematch to start things, but a memorable other final is a good way to go. Meanwhile, the next game on the dock and after that was the retroactive spoon off. And this one ended up being pretty weird. You had four players making their AFL debuts and one of them really took the spotlight. That being Harry Sheasel. Mazel Tov indeed. That was an awesome side to see along with an Israeli flag. Sheasel ended up being matched up with Liam Ryan for the bounce and got multiple early touches. And just Sheasel being involved in starting to play from the defensive 50 was a common thread all game. But this is someone who hadn't played defense really until he'd gone to North. So whatever Alistair Clarkson saw in him to make that decision to slide him back, it appeared brilliant. Now again, you could take this with as much salt as you want because it did occur against the West Coast Eagles, but at least this time, the Eagles didn't have to rely on top-ups. They didn't have to call anybody from the stands to play. I thought this was a pretty entertaining game. It kind of had a weird sequence where North kind of pulled away, second quarter, early third. We had what seemed like it was becoming baby-making footy. Then it seemed like it was just a complete blowout where you could just turn it off. Then the Eagles came back and ended up getting to within three in the final minute. It ended up being really frustrating. I thought that the Eagles had a really decent chance to win it just from the start. North definitely added more list-wise this past off season, but I was excited to see Ruben Jinby get a go of things right away, and he was very active as a tackler. He ended up with 12, which is the second most in VFL AFL history on debut behind Jai Newcomb, who had 14. And then the Eagles were doing well enough in the ruck early on, and then, unfortunately for North, Tristan Cherry went down. He had a right angle injury. He couldn't get up after Luke Shuey tapped him late in the first quarter. So that really put the onus on Charlie Coleman to come in for mop-up duty, and it was one of those situations where he may have not excelled in hitouts, but managed to work enough things to advantage, and then the Eagles couldn't take enough off of the hitouts that they ended up getting. And that just further reinforces my point. Maybe you don't necessarily need just a guy for hitouts, especially not when it's Bailey J. Williams. I think we're going to start to see more and more of a shift as teams evolve and as the game evolves away from just having like a away from having a true Ruckman. Yeah, I I really think so. And you can point to this game and then Gold Coast as well, where, like, Jared Witts had a great game, but what did it do for them? Where I just, I think it's becoming less and less important. When Cherry left, it meant that Will Phillips got on, and I was really happy for that. He'd missed all of 2022 battling mono, or as it's called in Australia, glandular fever. And Kane Corns loves to just absolutely drag North down for drafting this guy. And so... Great to see him getting involved right away. Got to the center square and kicked inside to Nick Larkey, who you called would absolutely thrash the West Coast back line. You said he'd end up with how many? I said five or six. Six straight from nine touches. That was just a wild guess. I didn't think it was that wild considering how he'd sliced him up last year. I mean, he's been this guy that he either gets like four plus or no more than one. Well, all, all of that was part of a 26-1 to 1 run for North before the Eagles were able to increase their pressure. But one thing I noticed throughout the game, especially as it went on, you know, at first I was thinking, man, they're moving faster. The Eagles are changing things up. They're more handball-oriented. Then when the game slowed down, but I realized, no, it's the same shit. 
They're still doing that good old swing around the defensive 50 and hope for the best. And it's just too predictable. We're so critical of predictable movement. You know, think about Melbourne last year where all they did was bomb it on the wings. Think about it like this. The idea of swinging it around, and you could compare this to running a play in basketball or if you're on a power play in hockey or, you know, you can compare it to soccer. I think there are a lot of places where you could use this. It's because you've got the defense, you know, you've got the opposition pulled over to one side and you want to send it to the other where you have a numbers advantage. But if they know it's coming, you're not going to have that advantage and it's got to be used selectively. And if it's not, you're just flipping things around for absolutely no reason. And it's just, and it ends up being a waste of time. It's a waste of time. It's ineffective. And it's just a chance for a turnover. Is it so ingrained in the players at that point because you've had McGovern and Barris there forever? Or is it more of a coaching issue? If we see the back line shift a bit, I want to see if those strategies change. And if not, I think we'll be able to pinpoint more that it is on the coaching staff. And that's my belief that it is something that Adam Simpson and his assistants have just drilled into the Eagles' brains. I will say there were things about this game for the Eagles that I liked. I was also thoroughly impressed with Ruben Jinby. He looks so ready to go. And even though he had the really bad missed dribbler, I liked Oscar Allen's game overall. Just glad to have him back on the oval and obviously big shoes to fill with Josh Kennedy having retired and Jack Darling being obviously in the back half of his career. And honestly, yes, that was a five-point miss by Oscar Allen, but no, that was not the play that cost him the game. And I'm just going to say it because I know you are, and I'm with you in this boat. Jermaine Jones, he's good. And he's one of the players that isn't quite doing the same thing as everybody else, more willing to really run with it from halfback, I want to see Jermaine Jones and Brady Hoff be those players long-term. And unfortunately, we didn't see Hoff in this game. So hopefully he'll come into the side soon. Of the other young guys, Noah Long did not play great, but he did get a goal. Campbell Jesser looks pretty ready. He often just looks like a baby. But on the other side, back to Sheasel, you know, all the highlights I had seen of him through Instagram, through this page, Baseline Footy especially, he's so skilled with the handball. It's already up there with any of the best midfielders in the game. And what's great about that is you could make use of that anywhere. And in this case, they made use of it defensively. But you could have him freeing guys up in a forward position. You could have him as a midfielder. I love what he said, you know, when they talked to him about playing defense, which he hadn't done until a month ago, where he said, you know, I've never really played there before. They told me where to stand. I'm not sure if I want to believe that, but I mean, I, I guess I have to. Eagles did manage to put things together a bit more from the middle of the third quarter going toward the end of the game. There was some clear fatigue for their defense after a few quick North entries, but North didn't can end up converting. But unfortunately, the Eagles took some time to really draw any closer. And by the time Luke Shuey drew high contact and kicked a goal to make it 85-82, it was under three minutes left and Absolutely everybody was cramping. It was a ridiculously warm day in the mid to high 30s Celsius, so mid to high 90s Fahrenheit. But you're indoors. Even though it was indoors, it was certainly affecting things. The heat and humidity were evident. When Kane Turner made his century kick and Curtis Taylor got his huge mark on the ground with about two minutes left, I thought, all right, we're done. But he hit the post. I thought we were going to have like a new Harry Jones. I wasn't so short. All I knew was the game is still up for grabs. And then Bailey Williams had a couple late errors. Caught holding the ball by Hugh Greenwood, but that possession only resulted in a point. Just under a minute left. A ball up near the middle of the ground with 16 seconds left. Williams blocks combat out, and that's all she wrote. North 12-15-87, defeating West Coast 12-10-82. You know that... DJ Khaled, what does he even do? YouTube thumbnail. I made one of those for Bailey Williams. Apart from those two plays, there was another time where he was supposed to be defending Nick Larky one-on-one. This was back in the third quarter after Charlie Combin had marked with little effort at center half forward to begin with. Then Williams just 
didn't end up running and jumping with Larky. He started with him behind the goalpost, pretty much at the fence. Fence. He was the man on Larky, and, well, really, he wasn't. That was Larky's fifth of six. And I was just amazed that anything Williams did didn't end up negatively affecting West Coast. So if you need a reason, Eagles fans, for Nick Natanui to be healthy, it's to make sure you don't see Williams doing stupid shit every other minute. Either that or give Harry Barnett an early debut. I mean, Callum Jamison isn't great, and he was ultimately subbed off for Jack Petrocelli, which is just an even more mind-blowing decision that it was Williams that you let stay on. Because Jamison is a more complete player. Petrocelli makes sense as a sub. Again, just another speedster there. I kind of love that we ended up with the six bottom teams from the ladder last year all facing each other. A little over 21,000 for this game, and you could tell the North fans were legitimately thrilled to open with a win. I mean, consider how unfulfilling their win against the Eagles was last year. It was just, I was happy for them still. And and I'm happy for, for Sonia Hudge still recovering from her cancer treatment. And she was just, you know, sitting at home eating some sheezles. North needs to, to partner with Cheezles for some packaging. It's a no-brainer at this point. Cheezle also had nine marks and 631 meters gained. Luke Davies, Uniac, are really active and visible 31 disposals. He's him. He also had a goal of behind and 10 clearances. Jack Zebel, 26 disposals. Nine marks, 667 meters gained. Zebel really returned to a defending role in this one, was eager to spoil... And that's definitely where he belongs. Jai Simpkin, 25 disposals and 7 clearances. Charlie Coleman, or... They pronounced his name weird, and I don't know what it was. But I, I heard a couple different ways. I'm just going with Coleman until I hear otherwise, but he had a goal in a behind. He had 13 disposals. There was 12 hitouts and 11 score involvements. Other than Jinbi, it was the older premiership core from the Eagles that was leading the way, and that's still not surprising. Luke Shuey had a goal and a behind from 27 disposals, 8 tackles, gained 594 meters. Shannon Hearn, I'm still surprised that he played on, considering the low prospect for this season, but good to see Bunga still out there. 25 disposals, 9 intercepts, gained 598 meters. His partner in crime, Jeremy McGovern, had 10 marks and 12 intercepts in it in a 22 disposal performance. Going further upfield, Liam Ryan, who made his debut in that premiership year, kicked three goals straight from 13 disposals and seven marks. And again, Jinbi with 12 tackles to go along with 15 disposals and a behind. Just looking at the team numbers here, Eagles were plus 17 in hitouts, 49 to 32. Not surprising. Also not surprising if you watched the game, North were plus 15 on clearances, 41 to 26 plus 17, 31 to 14 from stoppage. Also, Alistair Clarkson looked invested in this game, and I hope that stays that way for North, even as the downturn of results is expected because you aren't going to get every game against the Eagles. That said, you could already tell just like the way they've kind of incorporated some of his strategies. You're seeing them do a lot more with the handballs. And also forcing the Eagles to kick long down the line and making marking difficult, especially early on, that's a real sign that Clarkson is impressing his game plan upon this team early and often. They visit Frio next week, and I think there's a lot of intrigue to that game all of a sudden. I think I'm intrigued by pretty much every game this next round for various reasons. Tune in to our next episode to learn more about that. In the meantime, what the f- Fuck Port Adelaide. And what the fuck Brisbane? Now, we're asking the same question to both, but the connotation could not be more different. Yeah, they're, it's like, we're also asking very different questions. Um, Port Adelaide, 18-18-126 to Brisbane, 11 6 You said afternoon games at the Adelaide Oval get weird. Like, not so much the performance, but just the vibe is weird. I'm so used to them playing at night. It's, it's a little like LSU football. It's like, yeah, I know they play well in the afternoon, but the vibes are better at night. And sometimes they're wearing purple as well if it's a non-conference game. I like the purple, but that's a completely different story. What I didn't like was basically anything Brisbane did, and I still could totally see them winning the flag. 
but need good defense to win a championship and giving up 126 points, and it could have easily been a lot more than that had Port been kicking better. And it started off 5-9 at halftime and actually trailed by 12. It's more of a reminder that Harris Andrews did not have a strong year in one-on-one defense, especially last year, and he's without Marcus Adams for this season, and also he was without Darcy Gardner. So more importance for Jack Payne, for Ryan Lester when he's in, and also I expected the halfbacks, including Connor McKenna, to be able to be more two-way players, but really after thinking about it, going back and looking at some of McKenna's footage, and also Darcy Wilmot being back there, this is a team that just runs forward any instance they can. And they need to build up that defensive ability in their halfbacks in order for them to be meaningful in September. We all expect them to be there in September, but to have staying power, you actually have to defend. Look, I trust Chris Bagan to get this thing right, although normally they have been a team that, you know, you don't see them play in too many games in the 50s and 60s, but you also don't see them playing too many games in the 120s. Usually they're the team that piles on that sort of score. It was a 52 to 8 third quarter that really threw this game around. You know, the power got a well deserved standing ovation after that third. Lockie Jones had a nice third quarter. And when you look at the hair he's got, Lockie is an appropriate name for him. I was impressed with Miles Bergman. Obviously, the usual suspects up forward were really solid. Charlie Dixon looked as healthy as ever and has slimmed down a bit as well. And we expected Connor Rosie and Zach Butters to do good things as a tandem, but that tandem is now a trio. Hello, Jason Horn Francis. We've been expecting you. Jason Horn Francis didn't just live up to the hype he had before last season. He blew it out of the water. He fitted with those other two like a glove. Lemony Snicket actually once wrote about how the term fits like a glove can be inaccurate because, like, you know, you wouldn't want a gardening glove if you're, you know, trying to complete a heist in a museum. Okay, like, like a nitro exam glove. There are a lot of gloves that are inappropriate for certain situations, so we're going to stop using that expression. Right on. But yeah, he he played great, and Todd Marshall was really good. And even though he didn't kick particularly well, finishing 1-3, Mitch Georgiatis is so much better when Charlie Dixon's in. Going back to Horn Francis, though, he he was really the link between Port's center six and their forward 50. And given what we saw from him in terms of his natural talent last year at North, it's a spot that I kind of expected him to be in. I just didn't expect to be talking about his role in the contest like that. I expected the conversation to revolve around another trade acquisition on the other side of Josh Dunkley. And that might be the only time that we mentioned Dunkley. This already answers some of the things I wanted out of Port Adelaide for this year. You know, beat an actual contender. And again, round one is weird. And afternoon games in Adelaide are weird. Just to knock off one of your major obstacles that's been an issue for so long... Hard not to get excited, and if you're a Port Adelaide fan, I totally understand why you'd be so high on yourself and on this team after all of one game. Really, from the second half bounce onward, Port really tightened up their execution, and when you combine that with the pace they had, especially through Horn Francis and Rosie, they just overpowered the Lions through the middle third, and that's really the story. Surprised there's so little to talk about from this game, but... When the margin is what it is, I mean, that's what we got. To be fair, I dozed off for a little bit during this game, and I'm going to go back and try to watch more of it more thoroughly, so maybe I'll come back and hit you with more on Tuesday night when we record the preview. I mean, I I think this was pretty complete. Maybe I'll also just mention Sam Powell Pepper is awesome. Just played the hard-nosed game that we expected from him. Stick around, you'll find out which other player we've given the nickname Pepper to, though. But for now... Stats from this game, four Port Adelaide, Ollie Wines, one goal, one behind, one very rectangular head, 29 disposals and nine marks. I mean, he seriously does look like he walked out of Minecraft. Jason Horn Francis, a goal, a behind, 25 disposals, 11 score involvement, seven clearances and 532 meters gained. Ryan Burton, good job on the back end with 24 disposals, nine intercepts, seven marks and 512 meters gained. With Horn Francis being the link between the center six and the forward six, I thought of Burton as a similar role between the backs and the midfield. 
And that's something that I've seen from him for a while. You have Tom Jonas and Alir Alir being steadier presences in the back in particular. Darcy Burton Jones can kind of take on some of that duty as well. But it was really Burton alongside Lockie Jones who just roamed all over the place. Zach Butters, uh, 24 disposals. Miles, not to be confused with Miller Bergman. Yes, they're brothers. Also, not to be confused with Jason Horde Francis, apparently, because the papers in Adelaide made that mistake. Two behinds, 23 disposals, and 482 meters gained. I'm not sure if you saw this, Ethan, so I think it was the, the advertiser in Adelaide, and that led on the front page with a photo of not Jason Horn Francis. I mean, have you considered checking the numbers on their back? As someone who's now edited photos, it's like, I make sure when I'm captioning photos that I get the right people in them. You know, you either, they have something distinctive, even if you can't see the number on their back, whether it's a wristband or the shoes they're wearing or something. So that's, that's pretty sad. But both played quite well. Connor Rosie, a goal, 23 disposals, 10 score involvements. I really liked his showing. Heck, play like that, you know, that's the sort of guy that could start racking up the Brownlow votes pretty highly. Sam Powell Pepper, a goal, two behinds, 21 disposals. Alir Alir, 15 disposals and nine intercepts. And look, to be a top team, you gotta defend. One team did, one team didn't. You gotta have a guy like Alir that can rack up the intercepts, and he was really sharp. Nice to see him back in his form that we had seen so much of in 2021. And you wonder why he's a nap mini legend. Charlie Dixon, three goals, three behinds, 14 disposals, 12 score involvements, and 10 marks. And Todd Marshall, already starting off his year right from an accuracy standpoint, he kicked 4-1 with 11 disposals and 8 marks. Oh, I am actually going to mention Josh Dunkley again because he was one of the stat leaders for the Lions with 19 disposals, 9 tackles, and 7 clearances. And then Daniel Rich gained a kilometer, 1,010 meters, along with 7 intercepts and a 26 disposal performance. I just find it really funny that the game went the way it did considering how much at the half everyone was bitching about the free kick margin. And understandably so, it was 21 to 5. I mean, that might be worse than the 2016 grand final. And by that point, remember, the Lions led by 12. Free kicks ended up being 25 to 12. Efficiency inside 50, 60% for Port Adelaide to Brisbane's 37.5% and uncontested possessions. 257 to 130, and a lot of those weren't just, you know, passing the ball around in their own end. It was that Brisbane offered such little resistance. Man, it's fun doing these recaps again. We're going to catch our breath a bit and let you guys do the same, because we're going to try to pay the bills with this ad. Hey, if you're listening to this, you're probably a man aged 18 to 35, so obviously you want to make a podcast. A podcast? Well, that's a dumb idea, but sure, why not? How do I start? Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. It has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast or your phone or your computer. No fancy software needed. It's so easy you get edited while drunk. Anchor allows you to distribute your podcast on platforms like Apple, Spotify, and more, just like we do. Best of all, it's completely free. Not only is it free, you can even make money from listener support or ad revenue. Download the Anchor app. That's A-N-C-H-O-R, like on a boat, or on the Fremantle logo, or go to anchor.fm to get started. Plus, it's a .fm domain, so you're also helping out the good people of the Federated States of Micronesia. Welcome back. Once again, this is episode 80 of Americans Watching the Footy, our 2023 round one recap. And we had our first little overlap of the season. So, with two games going on on Saturday night, we each focused more heavily on one of them, so Benjamin, why don't you go first since the game that you were talking about was on before the one I talked about? Yeah, 35 minutes before, and I was plenty active on Twitter at Americans Footy talking about this one. It was the 3,000th BFL AFL game to be played at the MCG, and for the second year in a row, the D's and Dogs faced off in round one, and for everything that was new in this game, it ended up feeling quite a bit like the 2021 Grand Final, with the final margin, heck, the fact that Tom McDonald ended up having the final kick in the game on a set shot, 
It was a behind on, like, the goal he scored at the end of the grand final in Perth, though. I expected to really learn a lot about what the Bulldogs looked like under all the changes that Luke Beveridge had made. Looking back at the preseason game against North, they had rotated key forwards all over the place between Rory Lobb, Aaron Naughton, Jamar Eugle Hagen, Sam Darcy as well. And I expected them to get a decent amount of chances because with Stephen May out, it meant that a lot would fall on Jake Lever as well as Adam Tomlinson, who, who I didn't think super highly of last year. The game that really stood out for me for Tomlinson last year was when Sam Reed absolutely had his way with him near the middle of the season. But from the beginning, Lever was able to engineer play out the, out the back quite well and intercept as he always has. And Tomlinson did more than enough to keep the D's afloat in that respect. Scoring driven early by Melbourne small forwards, causing Pickett, much more on him later, as well as Cade Chandler. He was really involved on the ball, and after feeling at times last year that he was really close to finding a role, I was happy that he came into his own in this game at the start of this new season. Pretty even until close to the end of the first half, but I already noticed that Max Gone was playing everywhere and was really setting up behind the ball in particular, and I'm not sure if the dogs ever really figured out how to handle that. And I was surprised they hadn't thought about that possibility more because, again, thinking back to the 2021 Grand Final, Gone had another very capable tall with him in Luke Jackson, and he ended up being everywhere on the ground. So it was really no surprise to me that he pulled off something similar with Brody Grundy. The two of them split their time forward, ended up running alongside each other a couple times as well, which was interesting to to look at. Let's also note that the Bulldogs had all off-season to prepare for this, which makes it all the more mind-boggling. Admittedly, Liam Jones going down behind play near the end of the second quarter certainly didn't help. He was off to the rooms with a neck injury and was subbed out at halftime with Toby McLean coming on to take his place, and that's certainly not like for like. But by that point, Melbourne had already scored five in a row and worked it out to a 58 to 39 lead before the half. Kazi was working really well with Charlie Spargo as well. And Spargo is another one of those players who really never gets the respect he's due as kind of a half forward link. He's often someone who gets possessions before Kazi and often feeds some of the talls. In this game in particular, it was Ben Brown who was a prominent tall. Did not expect to say that at all. I thought that it would be sort of a Samson situation like we saw with Cam Guthrie where cut his hair, lose his powers. No, Ben Brown kicked four goals and none of them were on long run-ups. In fact, he missed his two chariots of fire-like shots, which is honestly really disappointing because the dramatically long run-up is like my favorite thing about him. We noticed that about him ahead of his hair in the second AFL game we ever watched back in round one 2020. That said, we didn't have as much to compare it to at the time, so we kind of thought that was just the norm. We realized it was the norm for him, at least. I ended up just being frustrated by the dogs in general. Aaron Naughton can mark like it's nobody else's business, but missed a couple pretty easy set shots, and every miss... Makes me understand the talk about moving him to center half back more and more because it ended up being really clogged in the forward 50 with all the talls there. And it made me think back to last year when Collingwood just tried throwing Darcy Cameron and Mason Cox and Brody Grundy forward against the Brisbane Lions on a Thursday night at the Gabba. The difference is that Lions Pies game was close. This was not. All the talls being within. 15 to 20 meters of the goal for the dogs meant that they were even more exposed on the back end. And between that and Max gone, be everywhere and all the talls fitting in seamlessly, that was what I was really going to think about the game until Kazi showed his other side. As we have both said, he can be brilliant, but he can also be a dipshit. And he was definitely a dipshit in this case. Near the middle of the second quarter, Pickett came in late launching off the ground, and I think getting Bailey Smith a little bit in the head as he kicked. If nothing else, he launched and went toward the head, and that's bad enough when the league has been trying to emphasize the importance of concussion protocol, especially amidst the lawsuit that's now ongoing. 
it's weird. You hadn't seen players taking off like this in a long time. It made me think of American college football more than anything. And we saw it a couple of times in this round. That really threw me off. Kazi ended up being suspended. How many games? Two. I honestly expected them to really mess it up and only go for one because the league continues to incorrectly prioritize outcome over action. What I think this shows more than anything is that their structure for handing out suspensions with the MRO when there isn't major contact kind of locks them into a spot where they are severe enough. And we'll come back to this point when we talk about a later game as well, a game from Sunday. I will just... Shocked when you compare this to the Tom Stewart suspension and acting like, you know, he's the worst person to ever live when this is something that if this wasn't a football play at all, this was a completely avoidable, you know, just don't jump at a guy type of move for Baz's sake. I'm glad the contact wasn't bad for Pickett's sake. I mean, there's there's nothing else to say for Pickett's sake there going through a couple other things of the second half. Lever continued a strong game. Kate Chandler got his first AFL goal, which was good reward for all of his efforts. And with Pickett being out for these next couple games, watch for him to be even more prominent as a goal kicker. On the dog side, I noted that Adam Trelore had a strong game. And I was thinking that Josh Dunkley's departure might have freed him up to be more of that midfield to forward link that we had seen from him at Collingwood. But overall, pretty easy win for Melbourne once they control... Honestly, after Kazi did what he did, completely unrelated that they took control, but they did. The D's 17 13 115 over the Dogs 9 11 65. And Melbourne's success has got me really pumped up for that Friday game at the Gabba. We thought it was going to be a test for them going there last year, and they blew Brisbane out of the water. Are we supposed to expect that again with how poorly the Lions showed defensively against Port? I don't know. I think it would be hard to see the Lions go to 0-2. I think the Lions win a tight one. Remember, Stephen May is expected to return this Friday, though, so even more difficulty for the Lions if they get meaningful forward chances. I th I'd say Melbourne by three goals. I don't know. This game just screams Lions pull out a late win at home. With the Bulldogs, I'm disappointed but not surprised. This just kind of on par with what I've come to expect out of them. The lack of adjustments, the lack of ability to counter a run. It's why I think their ceiling is just not that high. And it's why I think they're missing the eight. I don't know if I would go that far, but I think it's definitely a possibility. Some nice stat hauls for a number of the usual suspects for Melbourne. Clayton Oliver leading the way with 33 disposals. From that, he had 11 score involvements, eight clearances, seven tackles while gaining 488 meters. Christian Petraka kicked two behinds from 30 disposals, nine score involvements, eight tackles, and 661 meters. Love seeing those two being more involved defensively as well. Jake Lever had 21 disposals and a 13 intercept, nine mark performance, gaining nearly half a kilometer, 484 meters. Multi goal kickers for the D's. Max Gong kicked two straight from 21. Kazi kicked 4 1 from 19, along with 11 score involvements and eight tackles. And yes, Ben Brown. Hit 4-1 from 15 and 10 score involvements. Short hair, don't care. As poorly as things went for the dogs, they did have some pretty good individual sap lines. It's just, did you really notice a lot of those performances outside of, I mean, out of the seven players listed, I'd say I really noticed three of those, maybe? Jack McRae, a goal and 33 disposal. It seemed like a very quiet night for him still, though, just... Outdone by the combination of Oliver and Petraka through the middle. Tom Libertore, a goal behind, 32 disposals, 7 clearances, 459 meters gained. Adam Trelaw, a goal and 32 disposals. Caleb Daniel, 29 disposals, 493 meters gained. Ed Richards, 27 disposals, 16 intercepts, 609 meters gained. Richards was especially noticeable after Liam Jones went down. He was the steadiest marking presence there. Makes sense for him to pile up those totals. Aside from being the guy that Pickett launched into, Bailey Smith had a behind 27 disposals and 623 meters gained. And Tim English had 24 disposals. Glad to see English healthy to start the season. I expected he'd have some difficulty being the sole Ruckman against the combination of Gone and Grundy. The lack of support for him is going to be 
really telling for a lot of this season. Disposal efficiency for this game, Melbourne's 76.4% to the Bulldogs, 676 Shocked to see any team going above 75 And this is supposed to be a Bulldogs team where defense is one of their strengths. If you could see me right now, I'm just shrugging. Like Jim Halpert style. Well, Ethan, at least my game stayed competitive longer than yours. Yeah, I was so disappointed with my game. I was too. I was obviously seeing the scoreline for this one develop in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, and I'm not surprised that the Swans ended up beating the Suns, but that it got so out of hand so quickly is what was discouraging. Gold Coast 9-7-61, defeated by Sydney 16-14-110. Look, when the Swans play like this, they're not losing many games. If they had played like this in the grand final, I don't know if they would have won, but it would have been an amazing game with both teams in their absolute best form. The Suns were not going to win this game, but I would have liked them to compete. Instead, they fell behind 34-1, to and it could have been worse, because the Swans missed a couple of pretty easy looks, including one by Will Hayward from about 30 meters. Gold Coast did then get three straight to cut it to 34-19, but it was never particularly close after that. It was 49-20 to at halftime. Swans opened the third quarter strong and got the lead up to 75-27, and it was just... I was really disappointed that Gold Coast didn't at least look like a team that could hang in there at all when an opponent's playing their best. Really, I saw three guys show up for the Suns. Tuke Miller, Matt Rowell, and Jared Witts. And as I've mentioned, it's like, did Witts even do all that much good? Because, like, yeah, his stat line is impressive, but it's not like those 51 hitouts led to a lot. I was going to say, there are hitouts, and then there are hitouts to advantage. If those hitouts were meaningful, it would have reflected really strong clearance numbers for the Suns. They were plus seven, which is really not much to look at. And it was nice to see Tuke Miller being so active. There were concerns about an injury for him at the start of the season, but so little else happened there. And if you look at the other stat lines for the Suns, they weren't really effective stats either. Charlie Constable piled up 26 in a very small area in the back. Here's my thing with Jared Witts, who's good at what he does. He gets hit outs. But it's like, would it serve you better to kind of kind of hunt on the hit outs and just have a big guy that's good at other stuff instead? A more versatile player like Mabir Chol? Exactly. You could just use Chol for a lot of this. And that's what I was hoping they would do. And that's why I'm just thinking... We could be moving away from seeing the dedicated Ruckman because just when you're looking at roster construction, I don't know if it's worth it to have a guy just to do that, especially when you've got forwards like Tom Hawkins that are so skilled at the hitouts in, you know, coming off the throw in. Also, for a team that looked so bad defensively, maybe you could have used Caleb Graham. We regard him as really the centerpiece, not because he was maybe the most skilled player, but because he allowed everybody else to to fit into a spot more cleanly. We were really surprised to see Gray left out of this one. This is the sort of game that makes you think Stuart Dew is not long for this position. Again, the Suns were not going to win this game. Very few teams would even have a chance against the Swans with how well they played. But, But the fact that it wasn't competitive at all. Yeah, if they, like... I think back to last year, I think it was around two against the Demons, where it was like they got beat, but they competed, and then they ended up beating the Blues a couple rounds later. All I would have asked for is just compete, stick within it, stay within a few goals. Play like you belong against such a good team that's playing their absolute best, even if you don't win. Just, you know, don't just be there to get rolled over, and don't be the 2011 Suns. I know it's only one game, but it's all we've got to go off right now. And I don't want to leave this season thinking that 2022 was a mirage for Gold Coast. I have so much hope for this team. All I can say to that is hopefully they rebound against Essendon on Sunday. Meanwhile, with the Swans, the dominance was what we came to expect from them. Though, one newer face that I wasn't so sure about for a lot last year did really come to play. 
Logan McDonald had a pretty complete game, and I regard him as the clearest solution to what's going to happen post-Buddy if it's just one player. Now, obviously, it's not going to be, but he's going to need to be a focal point soon between Buddy and Reed being old. I mean, he's less of a true tall forward, but he's just a solid, versatile, well-rounded player who really showed me why people are so high on him. I really liked his game. Up and down all last year, kept out of the side a number of times. My biggest hope for the year for any one player for the Swans is that he has consistently good performances. Also, I've talked about how I don't particularly like him, but I respect his game, and this was one of those games that I really respected out of Tom Papley. I thought he was excellent, really just getting involved in every possible way on offense. You saw the Swans using those overlapping handballs pretty frequently, and Gold Coast just seemed unprepared for it, and I get if teams throw new wrinkles at you and you're unprepared for them in round one, but it's like, again, you've had the whole, you know, you've had the entire offseason to prepare for this team, so when they're doing something that isn't new, you've got to at least present yourselves as competent against instead they look like they had never seen it before and that was really disappointing stats of note for sydney i've got a lot of them to go through fire away chad warner did not kick a goal he had three behinds but 30 disposals to go with his 14 score involvements eight tackles and 713 meters jake lloyd did have a goal to go with his 28 disposals and nine marks he was present in a lot of those overlapping handball sequences Dylan Stevens, a goal, 27 disposals, 591 meters. Luke Parker, 25 disposals. Dean Rampey, 25 disposals and 12 intercepts. Errol Golden, a goal, a behind, 24 disposals, 601 meters gained. More about that goal later. Nick Blakey, 20 disposals and 586 meters. Will Hayward, a goal, three behinds, 19 disposals and 11 score involvements. Callum Mills, a goal, 19 disposals, 11 score involvements. James Rowbottom, 17 disposals on our first octopus of the season, 10 tackles. Tom McCartan, 16 disposals and 12 intercepts. And Tom Papley, 2 goals, 15 disposals, and 7 clearances. Wow, that's not a usual line for a forward like Papley to get that many clearances, but no, you'd expect Rowbottom to be the one getting those sorts of clearance numbers. But it just proves how he's able to kind of sneak into different parts of the ground and make his impact felt. And I'd be going nuts over that stat line if I was a Swans fan. Like, again, I think he could be a real turd. He's as obnoxious as it gets. He's got that look on his face all the time. He didn't have as much of that in this game. I mean, he was just obnoxious because of how solid he was. He was just, he played a really good game. And as annoying as I find him, He's a really good player that I'd love to have on my team. And I think any fan of any club that is in Sydney would say the same. Also glad that Tom McCartan had a strong start to the season, considering how the last one ended for him. For the Suns, smaller list I already mentioned. Charlie Constable, he had 676 meters gained as well. But Tuke Miller had 29 disposals, 8 tackles, 7 clearances. Similar numbers for Matt Rao. 28 disposals, 9 clearances, and 8 tackles. Jared Witz of Mahide, 25 disposals, 10 clearances, and those aforementioned 51 hitouts, but not many of them were super productive. And then Charlie Ballard defensively had 13 disposals and 10 intercepts. He was my sleeper for the Suns, and he did all he could to hold up his end of the bargain, but couldn't do it alone. Again, where's Caleb Graham? I would put Caleb Graham in over Darcy McPherson, who did have 22 disposals, but I thought just looked terrible. I didn't see much about him that about him that would convince me to keep him in. There was a play in the fourth quarter where he just kind of gave them all up right to Hayward for a goal. I was not impressed with him. I'll just leave it at that. I expected to be impressed by the Swans. I did not expect to be impressed by both New South Wales teams when this round was said and done, and I certainly didn't expect it halfway through the first game on Sunday. This was probably the game I was most excited for this round because I had no clue where it was going to go, and I think we were going to be able to draw a lot of conclusions from it, whereas Essendon-Hawthorne, like, 
I couldn't put my finger on how that was going to go, but I don't know if there are as many surprising conclusions. This one really caught me off guard, though. GWS going down 31 early to Adelaide, 28 at half. They cut it to five by the end of the third and go on to win by 16. 15, 16, 106 to 12, 18, 90. Forward pressure dictated a lot of this game where there were stretches where each team just spent a ton of time in the forward 50. And when the Crows had those chances, they largely couldn't capitalize on them and let the Giants hang around. While the Crows led at halftime by 28, they had just kicked 8, 12, 60, and then kicked 2, 4 in the third as well. And this is where it felt like the game wasn't as close as it was. It felt like the Crows should have been up by like 50 because they were kicking their asses up and down the field. The expected score from this game was actually like only a couple points off of what it was for each team. So maybe it's that the Crows had missed on some shots that were more challenging earlier. No, I think it's just evened out later. But if you watched this game start to finish and didn't really look at the score, you would have thought, oh, the Crows are in total control. And yet GWS, they let GWS hang around. In the first half, Tom Green was really the one who showed up for the Giants. In the second half, Stephen Canelio played a fabulous game. That's Stephen Canelio and his eyebrow in 4K. I did not expect such a start to the season from him. Like, if you are new to watching footy, you're going to mostly see the goal scorers. You know, you'd probably look at Toby Green and think he had a really good game, but even if you're new to this and don't quite understand and appreciate midfield play, you would look at Steven Canelio and say, that guy's on one today. Because seamless through the center square. And he was phenomenal. I, we'd always known about his running ability, but thought that he trailed off these past couple seasons. Back end of last year, the schemes that Mark McVeigh had the Giants work through were a bit more to Canelio's play style, but it just panned out today. Matt Flynn did well enough in the ruck, and the others in the center six did enough on the ground, particularly uh, Josh Kelly, the other vice captain alongside Canelio, to really enable him to do that running into the 450. He does so well. It's funny because for the first half, there were so many things I was pleased to see from the Crows. You had Sam Barry, who was really known in the past as a tackler, but was doing a lot running along the wings. Jake Saligo had a nice first half. Luke Pedler was fucking fantastic in the first half setting up the offense and just they couldn't convert off of those, but I really liked his game. Hopefully he can stay healthy because that was just his sixth game since being drafted in 2020. He was doing a lot of like the Taylor Adams type stuff where he linked the midfielders to the forwards, except he did it further forward than Adams does. But I was really happy with his performance and then... The Crows reminded us, oh, that's right. They still have, like, no defense. You know, Jordan Dawson, other than moving the ball out and kickouts and stuff, didn't do a ton. It was kind of like that problem Essendon had last year. They had a bunch of defenders who could do that, but very few who could um, defend. And both these teams are going to have to outscore teams to win. I like that under Kingsley, GWS are embracing that identity. Like, with this current roster, they're not going to win with defense, so they kind of have no choice but to go Tsunami. They're pretty handball heavy, especially out the back. I also want to give a little credit to the GWS fans, which I know doesn't usually happen. And if you were looking at this game, you probably wouldn't think it was much, but consider the conditions. It was hot as balls out there. Now, how hot are balls? Well, a couple degrees below body temperature, and that's what this was. It was you know, the paid crowd was 8169, almost all concentrated in the shade, but I'm not crediting the fans on attendance figures. I'm crediting them on booing Shane McAdam after his big hit on Jacob Ware, where he's going straight to the tribunal, which, again, I don't think it was worse than Kazi Pickett, but I liked that the fans realized, hey, this guy did something bad, we should let him hear it, instead of Boo, you used to play for our team, boo. The point with McAdam, he got sent to the tribunal because he made contact with Ware and because a concussion test had to be done. That's why Kazi apparently wasn't sent there. So again, 
MRO and the tribunal are in a bind with all the rules that they set up for themselves. And I think it needs to be a little more open-ended when you're looking at head injuries. GWS took the lead with five minutes left on the third when Riley O'Brien's tap off a boundary throw in just hit Jesse Hogan in the face and then rolled to Tom Green and his kick bounced through. Does that count as a goal assist for Jesse Hogan? Not sure. Luke Pedler then made a great play to put the Crows back in front, taking a Darcy Fogarty handball, kicked this little seeing-eyed dribbler to thread the needle with Josh Rochelle, kind of like a through ball in soccer. Good to see Rochelle back as well after missing the last few last year and doing more in the midfield. The Giants took the lead for good 17 seconds into the fourth quarter where Toby Green threw a high tackle but scored anyway. Also, credit to Toby for only giving away one 50-meter penalty. That's a weird thing to say about a captain, but when it's Toby, I guess it makes sense. I'm just surprised that the Giants held on the way they did when, at one point, they were down to just one rotation. They hadn't used too many of their interchanges to that point, and what I liked about that was that if they had wanted to, they could have just, with that one guy, you know, some people in and out really fast. But things worked out because Steven Tenilio made a great play slipping out of a Tyler Brown tackle and scoring. And then after Rochelle got one back, Nick Haynes scored what I thought was maybe the most inspiring goal of the round until an hour or two later. Hint, hint. But Taylor Walker got called for a foul 25 meters away from the play. The ensuing free kick, Haynes marked it and he was cramping up badly. Broadcasters thought, oh, there's no way he can even run up to kick this. And not only did he run up and kick it, he scored from 50 to put the Giants up nine. And th- and it would never... Hogan kicked one with 303 left that really put the game out of reach. Even though Pedler got one back 40 seconds later, that cut the lead back to 11. But Brett Daniels drew a holding the ball call against Tom Dude that had gone either way. Kicked one last goal to make it a 17-point game again with a minute 16 left, and it's probably not going to be a year of huge successes for the Giants, but this was a fun game and an inspiring and rewarding win. I think the best way to describe this game is rewarding, especially when you look at that Nick Haynes play, which that may very well end up being one of their highlights of the season. I don't think this is going to be a very good season for them, but that was cool. Stats of note for the Giants... Tom Green, a goal, 37 disposals, 12 score involvements, 8 clearances, 524 meters gained. And that was without his fan club. Stephen Canelio and his eyebrow, a goal, a behind, 32 disposals, 14 score involvements, 8 clearances, 810 meters gained. Callan Ward, a goal, 2 behinds and 31 disposals. Josh Kelly, 26 disposals and 7 clearances. Finn Callahan had a couple of mistakes in the first half but racked up 25 disposals. Toby Green kicked 4-4 off 19 disposals, 10 score involvements, and 8 marks. And perhaps the most damning stat of all, the Giants recorded 18 tackles inside 50. The Crows had none. It made absolutely no sense to me at first, I'll say. And then I was reminded of the lack of defensive depth that the Crows had. Still, though, I would have expected Tom Duday to have at least gotten to the ground and made something happen a couple times. Captain Jordan Dawson, still feels weird to say that. One behind, 23 disposals, 563 meters. Biggest ground gainer and disposal getter for the Crows. Ben Keys kicked one, one from 21 and eight marks, a more active game for him. Rory Laird, two behinds, 18 disposals at 10 score involvement, so a quieter game from him. 18 disposals was also the number that Josh Rochelle and Isaac Riken had. Rochelle kicked 3 1 for it had nine score involvements and gained 485 meters. That ground gaining is what's really new for him. And Isaac Rankin kicked 2 5 and had 11 score involvements. But yeah, the poor accuracy, including that from Rankin, is what really ended up dooming Adelaide. Despite 63.5% disposal efficiency inside 50, it was the finishing that was the issue. Oh, and I barely mentioned him. But I liked how Lockie Ash played for the Giants. Does his nick should his nickname be Must? I mean, you could also go with Ketchum. Uh, not as strong, I think. You could go with Wednesday. There are a lot of options here. I don't know. I noticed his mustache a lot, 
And I think Wednesday is just going to get misconstrued now because of how popular the series is on Netflix. Is that like an Adams Family thing? You are really not with the times. I don't watch like anything on any streaming services except for watch AFL. I haven't really seen Wednesday either, but absolutely it's an Adams thing. And the star is what, 20 years old? I guess that's why she became like a more popular character and was like a big Halloween costume this year. See, again, I know things that are on actual TV, but you're not with any pop culture that comes from streaming. And frankly, I don't know that much of things that aren't on, like, I mean, I'm familiar with, you know, The Simpsons, Family Guy, South Park. Um, I didn't watch Game of Thrones, but I was, like, aware of it because it was kind of hard not to be. But, yeah, if it's if they're streaming stuff, it's, I'm really out of the loop. All right, things we learned about Ethan. All right, I have no transition at all for this next game, but everything that was important about this game happened after the result had been decided. So how about let's talk about what happened before the result was decided first. Just kind of going a little chronologically here. Hawthorne are still the Hawthorne that we saw last year, only they're even younger. Nice debut out of Cam McKenzie. That was good to see. And Carl Amon got involved early, but they ran out of steam. And we've gotten so used to this. They love to run. They love to push the pace. And Essendon pushed it right back at them, which I kind of expected given the focal players for them. And it was a very involved game from Darcy Parrish in the midfield alongside Zach Merritt, which was nice. Merritt had to work through a tag from Finn McGuinness early, but got involved later. But Hawthorne were running all over the place, trying to get out of the pressure that Essendon were quick to apply, especially from their forwards. And that, I think, is something that's going to be really necessary for the Bombers because we bemoan what they have defensively and how they really didn't add to it last year. And we don't expect Jordan Ridley and Brandon Zirk Thatcher to be these intercepting and shut down machines. So a lot of that pressure will need to come in their forward half and particularly their forward 50. So I like that Brad Scott is doing that right away. This one stayed close for around a quarter and a half. I expect in more. I don't think this was as much Hawthorne running out of gas, considering how early the game shifted. I think it's just, I don't know. I think they, I think they did really run out of gas in the fourth quarter uh, with just how I saw them not being able to, to get back into it, but it was just a style they weren't able to counter. The issue is just, they're not very good. As much as it was fun to watch CJ and his goal celebration, where he just kind of, oh, just a, a totally clean kip up, Dwayne Johnson style. Yeah, that was also was funny watching him try to replicate it on bounce. Especially also because Tr Christian Petraka had tried it the previous day and hadn't done it nearly as cleanly. I wonder how sore Ben Dixon is now. Like, it just proves that he's an amazing athlete, even compared to the amazing athletes he goes up against. Even within that field, he's still in his own category. And I hope that he and the rest of Hawthorne can really figure out their pacing. Because I, I do think that there was some stamina issues that were involved later on, but obviously skill played a factor as well. Essendon were plus 14 on, in contested possessions and plus three in clearances in the first half, and those margins only grew. I was really impressed by a couple of the new acquisitions for Essendon in this one. Will Setterfield really fit into the midfield, and his speed was on display. And then Sam Wiedemann helped lead the way in some of that forward pressure and had a couple goals in the first half to show for it. Had a couple in a row near the end of the half. And then right before halftime, Alwyn Davey Jr. got his first AFL goal after Nick Martin grabbed the ball right straight out of the ruck and chipped it to him. Great to see the Davey family celebrating Alwyn Sr. and Jaden among them. And also Patty Ryder sitting next to him. Again, Ryder is back at Essendon as a director of Indigenous Player Development, and he played alongside Alwood Sr. for the latter's whole career. That extended the margin to 16 at the half, and from that point, it was pretty clear that it was going to get out of hand. There was a really cool video that Essendon tweeted a couple hours ago with Alwyn Davey in the... It looks like 
in the locker room or something. It's some sort of video from his childhood kicking a goal, you know, wearing an Essendon uniform, and then for him to do it, you know, comparing that and him in the real game and his celebration where he kind of leans back, le- leans to the right, has a similar reaction to it. I mean, they had talked about watching Allen Jr. and Jaden grow up in the Essendon rooms, and that that's just awesome footage. Anytime you get that in any sport, it's really special. All the way through the start of the fourth quarter, Essendon went on a nine-goal run. It was the first time that Essendon had kicked nine goals in a row since round two of 2013 against Melbourne. Both in 2013 and on Sunday, and Alwyn Davey kicked the third goal of that run. I'm just amazed it had been that long, more so than the... Alwyn Davy coincidence? I mean, nine goals in a row is pretty tough, and Essendon had obviously gone through a really difficult patch shortly after that with dealing with the drug saga fallout. But let's be real. The important stuff happened in the fourth quarter. Harry Jones had had a good game. Really glad to see both him and Wiedemann play strongly, trying to deal with Peter Wright's absence. Oh yeah, Peter Wright didn't play in this game. So much for him as our, you know, as a... Coleman pick? Wasn't mine, he was yours. He dislocated his shoulder at training just after signing a four-year contract extension. The contract extension news and the injury news came out about four hours apart from each other. So, Jones did well for himself, but he ended up being subbed out. And I think that's pretty understandable, considering the sub was... 588 days later, he was back. And he was involved immediately, because of course he was. Still so fast, almost magnetically attracted to the ball, and within a few minutes of getting on, Will Setterfield and Zach Merritt set him up, and Walla kicked a goal from 49. And the 68-plus thousand in attendance took off. Great crowd for this game. That's the sort of moment, like, the Hawthorne fans had to appreciate it really all 18 clubs, just phenomenal. To me, that's the highlight of the round. Without going any further, that's my pick for main character of the round. Yep, yeah, and, and, we'll, and we'll circle back to this at the end, talking about other nominees, but Walla. I'm so happy with this. He's a likable guy. He's a damn good player. It's great to see him back. And I loved hearing him being interviewed at, after the game, talking about what inspired him to get back. And one of the things that really proved to be an inspiration for him was watching some of the younger indigenous players grow, including Alan Davy Jr. The two of them were being interviewed together. And, th- and that was a really great moment. And just so many bright spots on the younger side for Essendon in general. Davy being part of that, of course. Sam Durham with a really clean game as well. Worked through things in the middle of the ground nicely, often starting clean passages toward goal, or if not starting them really confirming them if they started from the back third. Final score on this one was Hawthorne 9-11-65, defeated by Essendon 19-10-124. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bombers are on top of the ladder. And I think, I forget exactly what the stat was that Lee Montagna said on the first crack, but I think it was something like in the past 30 years, maybe? The team atop the ladder on round one has only failed to make the finals once? I think it's going to be a second time. I'm not going to get too high on Essendon off this one game. I'm not. I just hope that Harry Jones has a chance at redemption in finals and actually sends them to their first finals victory in nearly two decades. Look, they beat up a bad team, but if I'm an Essendon fan, I'm not going on like all of a sudden everything's cured. It's just what's nice is that they looked like a functional football team after an ugly offseason with a lot of stuff that Should have never happened. A lot of people getting treated poorly. Some bad hires. So much instability. It's just... It's nice to see them look normal and have their day in the sun. Because, look, this has been an organization that's been a punching bag for a long time for a lot of reasons. Some of which are self-inflicted. But this was a good day for Essendon. And even if it's just one day and what's probably going to be a ass season... I still think their ceiling is probably, you know, maybe 10th. I'm just, they needed a good day. And they had a good day. And a lot of people got to see it. And that's a good thing 
for this club. I like what Brad Scott was doing overall between the pressure and the setup that Essendon had behind the ball, and I wasn't as tuned into this as some people were, but looking at what some Bombers fans were saying on Twitter, they could see kind of when they cut to Brad Scott in the coach's box that he was getting aggravated over little things not going their way, which seems to be a good thing. Just that that attention to detail and that dedication is there right away, even when the game's cl- clearly been decided. You know, on one hand, I've talked about like coaches having attention to detail and recognizing positives. In this case... I think, you know, being frustrated over little details is also a good thing because it shows high expectations. It shows obviously paying attention to these things. It shows that you've probably been emphasizing and trying to work on these things. And it just shows that he's bought in, which sometimes when you've had a coach that's bounced around, it's like, is their heart going to be in it? I think while it's just one game, Brown Scott showed a side of investment. And that's good. Darcy Parrish and Zach Barrett led the way in terms of possession numbers through the middle, and that's no surprise whatsoever. The difference is, you know, I ragged on Parrish a lot last year for his stats not being too functional. His stats clearly were functional on Sunday. 37 disposals, 13 clearances, 9 score involvements, and gained 575 meters. Merritt with a behind, 29 disposals and 9 score involvements. Will Setterfield with a goal, 25 disposals, 10 marks. He gained 486 meters. Mason Redmond kicked two goals. He just loves streaming through from halfback to get those scoring opportunities. He had 24 disposals, gained 472 meters. Dylan Shield gained 572 for 23 disposals. Kyle Langford, who I know you really thought a lot of Essendon's best and worst hinged on last year. Had a behind, 22 disposals, 10 marks, and 505 meters. A sound game from Jaden Laverty with 22 disposals and 14 marks. Also on the defensive end, Brandon Zerk Thatcher with 8 marks, 12 intercepts, and 19 disposal performance. Looking further upfield, I already talked about what I thought of Sam Durham. He had a goal and 19 disposals and 9 score involvements. And then Archie Perkins, I hadn't really known what to think of him where he was in this kind of in-between midfield forward role these past couple years, certainly showcased as a forward 3-3 from 20 disposals. He had 10 score involvements and gained 510 meters. I'm going to really be paying attention to his development over the next couple years. You could totally see Essendon starting 4-0. They host the Suns next week, who I do think will play better. I think they think they're going to roll with the Suns, but I mean, they better fucking play better. That's a winnable game. Then the Saints, which is St. Kilda's big anniversary celebration. Remember how Essendon's 150th went, went south for them really quickly against the Blues. Maybe they can deliver that hurt to the Saints. And then they get the Giants, and then after that, it picks up with Melbourne, Collingwood, Geelong, Port Adelaide, Brisbane, Richmond. So so enjoy this first month of the season, Bombers fans. And if you know they get off to a great start and then fall off, I'm not going to laugh at them. Because the schedule is made for that to happen. I'm just going to try not to get too bullish on them unless they do it against some really legit teams. But the jury will be out for a while. But this day was not about, oh my god, Essendon's back. It's just as good, but good functioning. And I gotta say, Sunday was a good day for them. On the Hawthorne side, James Sicily, first game as captain, a behind, 30 disposals. 15 marks and 10 intercepts. We love a long sleeve captain, by the way. He's a bit of a punk, but I love the long sleeve look. Brian Myers' friend, James Warple. Two behinds, 29 disposals, eight score involvements, seven clearances, 575 meters gained. Even though as a team they did not play that well, I'm happy for him. I was also really happy with Josh Ward's performance. I saw him among Hawthorne's best and, and definitely statistically that's backed up. Just a very smooth handball, 26 disposals and 8 marks. He's not going to be a player that really pops out at a lot of people. He just fit into what they were doing as they were moving forward in their better moments. Will Day, 22 disposals, 8 marks, 456 meters gained. And Blake Hardwick, 2 goals, 17 disposals and 9 marks. I must say, it was a poor game overall from Sam Frost. I don't like saying layout players for bad performances, but but his was really noticeable. 
bad kicks from the defensive 50 leading to Essendon rebounds and just really frequently losing 1v1s that I thought he'd be doing better. This was not a game that I watched super intently as I was focused much more on the two games sandwiched around it. But it seemed like whenever I looked up, Frost was involved and it usually wasn't positive. There were there were a couple moments, but he was not particularly good. And about that other game you were watching, I mean, you got some really fun and just interesting contests on Sunday. And I'm glad I went back and watched the nightcap because the Ross Lion Cup didn't disappoint, at least if you were wearing red, white, and black. I would say this has to be the most surprising result of the round. Easily. I mean, I, I mean, this ahead of the GWS win over Adelaide. I'm surprised that so many people had tipped GWS to win. I had the Crows, as did I. Were they were they just riding on home field advantage? New coach? I don't know. Obviously, what Port Adelaide did was surprising. But for St Kilda to come out and beat Fremantle, ten seven sixty seven to seven ten fifty two with whatever they have it forward and still accomplishing that is pretty damn remarkable. I mean, it was a very Ross Lyon game in that the Saints ended up taking a lot of the pace out of it, and they got their young guys involved in that respect. Matthias Filippo, an active mover, but never, you know, doing anything too quickly. I was really impressed with how he played, though. I think of all of the new draft picks entering the league this season, I don't know if he has the highest ceiling, but he's clearly the most AFL-ready right now. He looked really sharp just with all of his involvement in the game i don't care what his stat line was he was damn good and if you get good games out of all three of him jack bytel and mitch owens maybe the saints can be all right my thing is just i can't see them playing much better than they did in this game which still makes me think their ceiling if everything goes right is about where they were last year but nonetheless was a good win over a team that made finals last season, and I like that their fans understood that. Like, for a Victorian team's fans to get really excited about beating Fremantle, that's a good sign. Mason Wood played a really nice game up and down the ground. I thought he was stellar. He would be one that I would honestly consider for the three votes. And yeah, there are pieces of a young core that I think the Saints can get excited about, even with Marcus Windhager still out dealing with his finger injury. Owens, Filippo. How about Anthony Caminiti getting a goal on debut? Yeah, he looked solid. I was you know, I was most impressed with Filippo, but Caminiti did his part. I'm glad you pointed him out to me because I really didn't have much to go off of other than that. I mean, I mean, nobody really had all that much to go off of considering. The only vision we'd had of him was a couple preseason headouts. He was a supplemental addition for St. Kilda when their injury situation got really bad and slotted in at full forward right away. I'm really disappointed with this performance from Fremantle. They looked flat. They looked like they were just going through the motions. I like what David King said about what they were doing as football of yesteryear, considering they were so kick mark, not looking to speed things up with handballs, which had led them to so much success last year, they seemed timid. 136 marks is extremely high for this era of footy. Oh yeah, but they only had 8 marks inside 50 for the whole game? That just doesn't add up. And they had 77 opportunities from defense, 77 possessions, and only got 2 goals out of them. So, questions about it in terms of forward placement. Nat Fife was a non-factor, and it's really got everybody questioning whether or not the experiment of swinging him forward is really going to work. And then I know, Ethan, you were questioning Frio's use of Luke Jackson. Want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, the thing is, if you're going to use him alongside Sean Darcy, you can't do the same stuff you did with Max Gone because he's not Max Gone. Yeah, Darcy, unlike Gone, isn't going to play all over the ground. Darcy is really good at what he does, and if you're going to have, have a guy who's basically just get all the hitouts, he's a very good one for it, but you're not going to be able to 
put him in all these different spots like Melbourne could with Gone, and in turn, that's going to change how you play Jackson. Now, I thought the more Jackson played towards the midfield, the better the team looked. I mean, center half forward is a spot that makes sense for Jackson based on everything that we've seen for him, from him, his two years at Melbourne. And I, I liked it when he was attending center bounces when he wasn't in the ruck. I like that tall presence there. He only had 12 disposals, and I think it was just the game didn't come to him as much in this case. And I think the way I would use him is, you know, bring him forward when you can. You love having him in there for forward hitouts and stuff. He's a gifted goal scorer. He ended up with two behinds in this game, but it's going to take some time for him to settle into his role. That's not something I would worry about as much as just the Freo really looked like a team with four or five guys that did a lot. I mean, Brett and Cox, Hayden Young, Luke Ryan, good showings. Jordan Clark, very active as well. No surprise there. And I mean, I mean, it, it was the typical pieces being active, but I mean, I love Hockey Schultz, even though his numbers weren't huge. I thought he just had a sound game in terms of ball usage. Caleb Sarong picked up a whole lot of disposals, but I didn't really see much to him other than that he had the ball. And Will Brody, I mean, he had 20 disposals, but nothing special. Also, Nathan Wilson is a massive downgrade from Griffin Logue. I don't care that he had the 21 disposals. He did not look good. I also didn't understand starting Liam Henry over Bailey Banfield. Especially when Banfield performed better last year when he was in the main 22. Josh Tracy, I wasn't particularly impressed with. I was okay with my sleeper, Ethan Hughes. Yeah, I ha had a decent game between half back and the center. I just, it's, I don't get how you don't have Banfield in your best 22 and have him as that 23rd guy. And I don't know how content he's going to be doing that longer term. He signed a contract extension this past year, but I don't know. Maybe he's maybe he looks to move on if he continues to be a margin selection like this. 30.8% efficiency inside 50 for the Dockers. That's putrid. And sure, Callum Wilkie had a nice game. Dougal Howard and Jack Sinclair made important plays, but I feel like this was a game that Frio lost more than anything, which is also what we said about them when they played the Saints in round two last year. So maybe it'll end up okay for him? I don't know. You asked me before we went on air which team's loss is going to be the most, you know, the most devastating come season's end. And I think it's this one because Brisbane, they can recover the percentage. I think these are four points that the Dockers really expected to have. And instead, their last goal came with nearly 15 minutes left in the third quarter. Um, it was Schultz's second goal off of one of Liam Henry's few plays. It was like, yeah, he should be out there. It was a play where Liam Stalker just looked terrible. And once again, I don't get why Carlton fans hyped this guy up so much. He went for a ball, ignored the man. That left Schultz open. Henry handballed to him. He scored. And then from there, the Dockers kicked six behinds over the final nearly 35 minutes of clock time. We got used to inaccurate Fremantle, but... I don't know, this one just seemed particularly difficult to stomach, especially considering the, the scoreline is what it is. Pepper Owens got one back. Pepper Owens? Mitch? Yeah. Mitch? Michito Pepper, like Shishito Pepper. Is he the one in 10 that's spicy? I think he had a pretty spicy performance. I, I, like, I like him a lot, too. As I said in our previews talking about him, he plays a bit taller than he is, and he's really willing to take on bigger assignments of the air. He's also just an enjoyable player to watch. He scored after Filippo had dropped a mark, then Filippo handballed to Wood early in the fourth after a rare Jordan Clark mistake where he couldn't get a handball out cleanly. The Saints took the lead for good on a Jade Gresham goal with 14.41 left. It was one of the few fuck-ups by Filippo where he jumped in front of Owens trying to take a mark, and he dropped it, but Brayshaw ended up just knocking it to Gresham, and it worked out. And then a Mason Wood left snap, stretched the lead to 11 with 13.20 left. And Zane Cordy, who I thought looked really sharp in his first game as a Saints, made it a three-kick game on a goal with 9.19 left after 
Nathan Wilson's most egregious mistake of the night, where he handballed to Hayden Young in a spot where he was guaranteed to get tackled. And that was it. That, nope. that basically did it. Um, wow, just a single point scored over the last nine minutes plus of clock time. That is what I really saw people talking online about it being a Ross Lyon brand of footy. They got the lead and they managed to shut it down. The Dockers had a couple chances with five, six minutes left. Schultz couldn't pull down a mark where he would have, you know, had he had it, would have been next to the behind post and he would have needed to kick a snap. Would have needed to be like a right snap. I don't know if he would have gotten it, but he would have at least had the chance. And then... Brennan Koch, who I thought had a really nice game, had a really shitty kick after getting a free for insufficient intent. And you know, the Saints finish this one off, and new coaches are 4-0. What did you expect the new coaches to be? Like, 1-3? and three With maybe 2-2? Two and two? The one I assumed had to have been Brad Scott. Uh, let me check what I picked, actually. I had a feeling you tipped North over the Eagles. I think we talked about this. Yeah, I had North and I had, okay, I had North and I had Essendon, so I would have said two and two, but I wasn't super confident in either of those. Well, they hadn't. Again, I'm not going to get too high on the Saints off this one game, but if Ross Lyon defense is all it's cracked up to be, this can be just a pain in the ass team to play against. I think them and North are kind of parallel in that, where it's like, I don't know how good they are, but they could be annoying. And... The next few weeks, they can actually get off to a pretty nice start here. They face the Bulldogs X. They'll be the away team for that technically, not that it makes much of a difference. Bulldogs honestly might need to be sweating a bit. I think there's a lot at stake for the Bulldogs. I don't think they can afford to fall to 0-2, especially when you consider the absolute gauntlet of games they have over the following four weeks. Yeah, they have a Thursday against the Lions, round three, then Richmond at the G. It is a road game against Port in the Gather round. And then Anzac Friday at Frio. Yeah, this this could be ugly. So all of a sudden the Saints come in, gotta feel pretty good about themselves. And not just that, in the weeks afterwards, they've got the Bombers, which all of a sudden is a game that I'm much more interested in as part of that anniversary celebration. Then the Suns, and then then it picks up, starting with the Gather round. against Collingwood. I'm not getting too high off the things off of that one game, but it was a, a good core to believe in. They develop these guys right because there are some pieces here that you can work with between Owens and Wagonine Valera, and obviously Filippo, who I think seems like a pretty popular dude already, and for good reason. I don't know, and I hate to kind of lower expectations after such a nice performance and a fun, rewarding win. But are Ryan Burns and Jack Bytel going to be able to put up performances like that? But maybe Bytel could be part of it. You know, if those two do that, they could be part of a core where you see this as a final team again in just a couple of years. But I'm going to have to see that a lot out of them because while this was quite a good game from them, this isn't something that I'm especially accustomed to. As for the actual stats, Brad Crouch, 30 disposals. Jack Steele, 28 disposals, 575 meters gained. Ryan Burns, who is only 21, so maybe the future is pretty bright for him, but 27 disposals, 580 meters. Jack Sinclair and his very, very unappealing haircut, 26 disposals and 543 meters gained. Jack Sinclair or Jake Steen, take your pick. Uh, they're both bad, but I'll go with Sinclair. Callum Wilkie, 24 disposals and 12 intercepts. He did give away a 50 that led to an easy goal after he argued a call. It was a push against Matt Tabiter that in real time looks off, but you watch the replay, it's like, okay, I see why that was called. You saw the extension of the arm. Mason Wood, two goals in the behind on 20 disposals. Naziah Wagonine Miller uh, behind 18 disposals and 526 meters gained. And Jack Bytel, a goal, 16 disposals and 7 tackles. I'm starting to think, other than, I mean, you look at some of the names on this list, other than Mason Wood, I think the Saints really need to play into the youth movement. And even if it means lowering your ceiling a bit for now, 
maybe after this year you sell off a couple of the older guys, such as Wood. You know, I would go out this like Hawthorne's gone after it and decide, all right, instead of being a team that's kind of scratching for that last final swap, let's really settle in and dig deep and rely on the young guys because there are young pieces here with a lot of promise. And if the Saints actually show a sense of direction and stability, this could be pretty fun in a couple of years' time. The question is, is that is that what Ross Lyon came in for? What the hell is going to happen upstairs? They just had another guy leave to go join the Wallabies. Like, yeah, they're, they're former head of football. Yeah, the day before round one, which is, you know, a sign of a well-functioning organization where nothing's going wrong at all and everyone's happy. Stats of note for the Dockers, Luke Ryan with 37 disposals, 13 intercepts, 13 marks in 775 meters gained. That is a fantasy owner's dream. Brennan Cox, 30 disposals, 20 marks and 14 intercepts. Honestly, that might have been even better for fantasy owners. Hayden Young, 30 disposal, 13 marks, 11 intercepts, 511 meters. Jordan Clark completes this ridiculous stat haul for the back with a behind, 28 disposals and 11 marks. In the middle, you had Caleb Sarong with 29 and 7 clearances, and Andrew Brayshaw with 26 and 7 tackles, but I didn't come away thinking, wow, those guys were really active. I came away thinking, man, it was disappointing that they didn't do more. And when... Frio had 30.8% disposal efficiency inside 50. That feeling makes sense. In his first game as captain, I wasn't especially impressed with Alex Pierce when you consider the numbers the rest of the defense had, which, you know, they kind of padded with all of the kick mark stuff. Pierce ended up with 20 disposals, but the one who is a major concern to me is Nathan Wilson, along with another Nathan who is out of position. Yeah, net five, nine disposals. Playing him at forward is weird. I mean, I get when you've got an aging player and you want to put him somewhere where they have to run a little less, but it doesn't seem to be the right spot for him, at least off of this one game. And yes, it's one game. I know, but... But you'd expect him to do more against the Saints. You'd expect him to do more altogether. Let's close this episode out with something fun. We go over the nominees for Mark and Gold around every week, and that time has come. It had come. Our Mark of the Week nominees are Shady Bolton going over Tom DeConing and Toby and Curvis, Ollie Henry over Darcy Cameron, and the winner. And this could honestly be one that we're talking about come Brownlow night. I mean, he, he's got a hand on the car already. Harry Himmelberg with serious hang time on Riley O'Brien's shoulder. This was a great, great play. Yeah. I mean, Wilkins was nice, but Himmelberg's was just so clean. And I wonder if it's if it might get overlooked because of just how clean it was. Just the landing was soft like it should be. Stood up there for a ridiculously long time, especially considering O'Brien's the tallest curl on the ground at 204 centimeters. And Himmelberg's no small man to be taking that. But yeah, obvious winner there. I think it's a bit more competitive looking at the goal side of things. You had Errol Golden running through the middle, having a bounce and kicking from 53. It was a really clean play with a combination of a Callum Mills toe poke and a quick Isaac Heaney handball to set that up. And I honestly think that's what's more notable than Golden finishing from 53. So in my opinion, the real two contenders, you have Chad Wingard dropping a mark, but spinning away from Andrew McGrath, selling candy to Brandon Zerk Thatcher before finishing from 24 out, and then Sam Switkowski picking up on the boundary, avoiding Callum Wilkie before dodging Mason Wood and scoring from close range. Ethan, I think I have my winner for goal picked, but how about you? This is tough. I think I'm going to go Switkowski. You know, Wingard, it was cool because you could see, you know, if you watch from a high angle, you can totally see how he... How he thought it up. He totally thought the whole play out, and it was less improvisation and more by design, but I thought Switkowski's was really neat, and it required some quick instincts, and wasn't set up by a drop mark, so... Yeah, that that's actually why I picked Switkowski as well, because of the dropped mark. It's why I wasn't so keen on Jason Horn Francis's goal the round last year, where he 
uh, against Gold Coast in a down game in every other respect for North because that was set up by a dropped mark. So if we're going in order, ranking them, Schwitkowski 1, Wingar 2, Golden 3, and for Mark, it's Himmelberg 1, Bolton 2, Henry 3. That's spot on. It's rare that we so cleanly agree on this, so I'm looking forward to getting into more arguments about this and, you know, really debating the merits of some of these plays. I am going to be complaining much more about the MRO, you know, Pickett's hit being called careless. If that's careless, then I'm a three-time premiership player with the Brisbane Lions. Buddy Franklin will not get to play in what was supposed to be his final game against Hawthorne, because he gets <laughs> for his bump of Sam Collins. And then we'll find out about McAdam, because he's got to go straight to the tribunal. How could you look at what he did and say that that's significantly worse than what Pickett did? I mean, both were bad and reckless plays, but Pickett launched off more, but the difference is McAdam made contact. You also have the image of, like, all of the water coming out of Ware's mouth, or... I think it's just all the sweat coming on because it was sweltering. Whatever it was, it, the, the visual does nothing to help McAdam in this case. It's... Again, though, that's not how this should be done. And we praise the AFL so much on how they do video reviews, how they explain everything cleanly, but they also regularly get suspensions just completely wrong. So looking forward to seeing where the wheel of discipline falls there. And really, that's all we got because it's pretty clear that the main character is Anthony McDonald tipping Woody for all the right reasons. I thought it was going to be the MCG turf for a while. I thought it maybe could have been Harry Mackay for slipping, but it's Walla. He wins the week. There will be times when the main character is a negative thing. This is not one of those rounds. If it had been the turf, you could have kind of also called Ed Sheeran the main character, but I'm just so happy for Tempo. What a great moment for him. And hopefully we'll see him in the main 22 at some point and really get in full games out of him again. So before you know it, we'll have round two coming up, and I know you're a big fan of a lot of these matchups, and I'm looking forward to diving into them with you in just a couple days' time, so watch for that next upload. Hopefully you're following us on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get our podcast. There should be a follow function anywhere, including on YouTube. We're at Americans Footy there, as we are on Twitter. Personally, I'm at BenjaminHK01 on Twitter. Personally, I'm at Castle Media. And personally, Brian Harambe the Footy Cat is on Instagram at Cat Named Brian. He has the squeakiest voice. I'll try to post more stuff of him. He's pretty great. Yeah. And you're pretty great for listening all the way through this if you did. So, thank you. Thank you.